I have a, a burden to express this morning, and I need the grace of God to be able to speak this in a way that is life-giving. There's two ways that you can approach every true idea. It can be true. Pharisees had truth, and they crucified Christ. We're not wanting to go in that direction. So conservative truth can be true, but it can also be wrong. And there's a delicacy and a vulnerability that we as the body of Christ are facing right now, whereas we could assess what is going on in this world correctly and say that is wrong, that is evil, that's a lie, but respond in the flesh. And we could respond in a way that is exactly opposite of Christ. And what we're doing is merely responding to a wrong with another wrong, even though we are right in our assessment. I have a desire to function as the church of Jesus Christ in this hour, which means we must be filled with the Spirit and must respond with love. However, love is not passivity. Love is not appeasement. Love is not correctness. Love is not a seeking after public approval ratings. Love is the animation of truth. And so if something is true, I want to respond, but in agreement with God's nature. So how would God respond right now if he were here in a body and he had the ability to choose and direct that body? Well, that is the way it is. That is the reality that we live in because that's what we are. We are the body of Christ. So it's no longer a what would God do. Let's show it. Let's demonstrate it. Let's declare to this world that God lives, that he is seated on high, he is triumphant and victorious over the grave, that what he did 2,000 years ago is still efficacious today. The church is a very real and active and living organism. However, many of us look at it as a bunch of buildings we need to reset our understanding of what the church of Jesus Christ is and we need to be functional. I'm gonna ask for the Holy Spirit to lead me in the selection of words and the way that I speak this because I do need grace for this. Father, I need you and I acknowledge that this message will fall flat if it does not have power, if it does not have your enabling Holy Spirit. Lord, if my perspective needs to be sharpened and corrected, please help me with that even as I speak. Lord, I simply desire to proclaim what is on your heart. I want your message to come forth in this generation. I want your church to rise up. So please, Lord Jesus, harness me to speak what is on your heart. Lord, prepare us to hear your word. It's in the precious name we pray, amen. So the title is very telling if you understand history, The Burning of Rome. And I'm in, supposedly I'm in a series on the spiritual biography of a nation. I'm, I feel like I'm somewhat fudging it. I'm going to bring in a little American history just to sort of validate this as part of that series. But this is a present tense burden that it's like I could care less if I'm in a series. I know what is burdening me and I need to express it. The fact that this does match exactly where I'm at in um, the flow of American history. During the weeks, for those of you that are unfamiliar, I've been going through World War II and I'm, oh, I don't know what message I'm on, like 55 or 56 and I'm in 1943. It's taking me forever, right? So I started in 1939, World War II does, and I'm only in 1943. It goes all the way to 1945. So I mean, we're talking a hundred messages potentially on, a, on this. In, what I'm doing on Sundays is I'm going through a process. I'm not trying to teach history, whether it's in World War II or it's America. I'm not trying to teach history. I'm trying to teach God's ways in and through history and how that parallels with our life. I wanted to teach you the word of God, but I'm clothing it in the historical framework to help us understand because right now our nation here in America, North America, is under siege. Our heritage is literally being toppled and spray painted. 
What is our heritage? Why does that matter? I was talking with a good friend of mine this past week when I was in New York, and we were discussing at what point is it right to stand up for our history, like the American history, and what point do you just say, look, that's not my battle. My battle is the kingdom of heaven, and I'm not going to die on the hill of American history. I think that's a, that was a very good question because I've dealt with that too. That's, that's wrong. That's not actually true, but do I make that my point? I mean, I have the gospel to preach over here. Do I really want to defend a statue of Andrew Jackson? Is that my great end? You know, no, it is not. And yet, I brought up this as a parallel. I say the reason we're struggling with this is because, and, and he, is, he was very close to his father, and his father died this past year. And when he tells the story of his dad's final stretch, it's so remarkable. I mean, it moves me to tears. Uh, it is such a powerful story. His dad had flaws. His dad was not perfect. And yet, when he remembers his dad, he is empowered and strengthened to live his life for Christ. And so I said, imagine if we deleted your dad from your memory and we just removed it. And I say, is it, why, why do you care? I mean, your dad is not Christ. Your dad had flaws. Why don't we just delete him? And what is the response? The response is, you can't do that. And yet, well, is that your real focus? Is that the hill you're going to die on? Is that I can't delete your dad from your memory? And isn't it all about Christ? There is something about our history that matters. And though it is the secondary hill, it is not the primary hill that we die on, Calvary is what we preserve more than anything. But there is something about our heritage that cannot be deleted. It is full of flaws, guys. If you're studying any heritage, we take any nation, and I stick it in front of us, and I say, let's unpack it. Every single nation is going to be full of a whole bunch of humans with a whole bunch of problems. But even when we come from humans with problems, every single one of us could analyze our parentage and analyze where we come from, and we could say, oh boy, look at that. And we could see the flaws, or we could see the fact that out of that came grace to us. I am who I am because God showed me grace through my parents. I have a sister that prayed and wrestled for me. I have a family that fought and stood for me, though they did it imperfectly. This is a nation that though it has had many flaws, and we could focus on those because I, I, I get it when people start saying, hey, oh, look at this, look how they treated the Indians, look at what they did here. And I'd say, yeah, I agree, that wasn't a good idea. Yeah, that was a boneheaded mistake. Yeah, I agree with that. However, do you see this? Do you see this? Do you see this? Do you see that God has shed his grace on us? And never in the world has there been a nation like this that would preserve. I mean, you know how many people have found refuge here from evil governments, from totalitarian governments? You know how many people have found refuge, have found life? You know how many gospel tears we have sent out into the nations? We have represented ascending force into this world unlike any other nation. We have something precious, and I don't want to allow that to just be toppled and spray-painted without a fight. But in the process, I don't want to lose sight of the message of all messages. Jesus and him crucified. That's what this is about. God wants to build us as the body to testify of who he is in this generation. And when I go out to speak, my message is not America the beautiful, it is Jesus Christ, the beautiful. And so knowing how to balance those things is very, very significant right now for us as the body. The burning of Rome. There's an ancient lie, and by the way, it didn't get sponsored just in our generation. The Christian. The Christian is the carrier of a disease. The Christian is the carrier of destruction. So if you know the story behind the burning of Rome, you're, you're going to catch on very quickly to where I'm going with this. You know that this world hates the light. They love their darkness. And so though we lovingly administer the light, though we are motivated by love so that they would see, the interpretation of that is very different. You see, when you are given light and you shoo it away, it actually harms your life. This is a really funny statement I'm going to make here. But when someone encounters a Christian, they get a fragrance, as Paul says. There's a fragrance that they're getting. It's the fragrance of salvation. However, when they reject it, do you know that it actually does them harm? 
It's a strange phenomenon. But when you reject truth in your life and you harden to it and you push it away, it actually has a consequence in your soul. However, when you encounter that fragrance and you receive it and you delight in it, it heals you. This is a tension that we face as Christians because you're going to see this throughout history that when Christianity enters a culture, it is going to create a friction. And there are going to be those that are going to actually rise up against it to quash it. They are going to look at it through a very odd lens. Where we look at it, we're like, that person is just trying to help you. That person is laying down their life for you. That person sacrificed for you. And you're going to call that evil? And so as a result, this is not new. This is ancient. And it's an ancient lie. And though it is a lie, it is still real to the people that are thinking it. And that's an important thing for us to recognize is the world thinks as the world. We show a mercy to that. We recognize, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. They really don't understand. Our desire is that they would see. But we recognize that even though what we are doing is giving them an opportunity to live, an opportunity to be made whole, they don't always see it that way. The ancient truth, the Christian is the carrier of life. And do you notice I made that capital? And the carrier of love, I made that capital on purpose. We're not talking about worldly love. We're not talking about just mortal life. We're talking about eternal. When we go into this world, the body of Christ changes it. It offers life. It's very, very important right now because of what is happening in the landscape of culture is we are seeing the ancient lie begin to be, beginning to be expressed afresh. John 10.10 is going to clarify this. This is Jesus, the creator of the heavens and the earth, knows what he's talking about, guys. And he is going to create a very clear distinction between the two powers, between the two kingdoms. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. The thief. However, Jesus is going to then clarify that he, he says, I have come that they may have life. I should have made that a capital L, life. And that they may have it more abundantly. What does Jesus come to bring? Life and that more abundant. This is a fact in scripture. This is the truth, the ancient truth. It's going to be important in this message. Acts 24, 1 and then 5 through 6. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, and they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. Yeah, Paul is a great enunciation of the body of Christ gone mobile. You see, we're going to have two bodies of Christ. I know that sounds funny at first, but I'll, I'll delineate that. We have the actual physical body of Christ when he lived here on earth. Remember the one that hung on a cross? Uh -huh. And then we're going to have a spiritual body of Christ, one that because of faith in him is going to be grafted into him and is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Our pathetic mortal bodies that are fading away are going to become a dwelling place of God and we are going to be functioning as Christ in this world. We are not Christ, but we become a body, a representation, a physical manifestation of the invisible realities of his purchase on the cross. And so what we see is Paul is going to showcase in the book of Acts, we're going to begin to be acquainted in history with how the world is going to respond when that happens. Paul is going to have a boldness that makes us all look very sheepish. He is going to have such an audacity, such a fearlessness, he is going to go into cultures that want him dead and he is going to boldly proclaim. He will get stoned, taken outside the city, pop back to life, and then what does he do? He turns back and he goes right back in. Cuckoo. This is abnormal to, to natural man. It is the way a Christian behaves. Paul is showcasing something. It would be good for us to witness because Paul is actually going to say, what you have seen, heard in me, do. Okay, you mean when I'm stoned, I go back in? <laughs> I mean, now, that's not a prescriptive story. That's a descriptive story. In other words, every situation, you need the wisdom of God. But yeah, what you saw in Paul there, 
yeah, you, you need more of that in your life. So this is still this story in Acts where Paul is being brought before Felix, okay? You have an attorney that is literally laying out his case on behalf of the Jewish leadership. It's the church of the time. However, it's a corrupt church. It's the same church that crucified Christ. This is not a healthy church. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews, all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. We got an ancient lie going on here, guys. Now, all of us, you know, we're Paul fans, right? So when we hear that, we rise up. We're like, how dare you? He's spray painting, you know, our our history. It's like, hey, excuse me, oh, lawyer, attorney, Tertullian. You get your grubby hands off the truth, You're saying something that isn't true. However, this is in the Bible. Isn't that interesting? The lie is like in the Bible. The Bible's true, but it also allows us to see how the enemy works so that we can recognize that there are two opposing factions. And darkness always goes to the ancient lie. This is your problem, O Felix. You know you have issues in your kingdom. If we got rid of the Christians, you wouldn't have problems. Classic Logic. This has always been the logic. If we can get rid of the truth, we would be fine. If we can get rid of this Jesus character, we would be fine. So Paul actually has a defense. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city, and they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts. I had a mask on. I was six feet away. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. So we have the truth, but we have a lie. We are being set up in this hour. And the story of the burning of Rome is so parallel that it behooves us to not forget our history. Chicago, Illinois, July 2020. So the city's Board of Health has declared gathering churches to be public nuisances. Now, at first, we laugh at the term public nuisance because we're like, it's such a pathetic description of something. It's sort of like a fly buzzing around. It's like, it's a, it's a nuisance, and it's a public nuisance, right? However, this is a legal tactic because in this district, uh, the law states that a public nuisance does not need any judicial trying to be able to address it. You don't need to take it through a court of law to address a public nuisance. Because it's a public nuisance, the the leadership has immediate ability to action. And they can mediate the problem. They can abate the problem. So according to the law, the city leaders have the power and duty to cause all public nuisances affecting the health of the public to be abated without judicial process or public notice. What does that mean? If it's an animal, like it's a rabid dog, Abatement means put it down. If it's a building, in this case it is, the abatement means bulldoze it. So actually there's a threat over churches in Chicago to be bulldozed right now. Isn't that an amazing thought? Because they're public nuisances. Well, Why are they public nuisances? Because they're spreading a disease. That's the thought right now. The idea that is being presented is when people gather, disease is going to spread. So when churches gather, diseases are going to spread. I mean, you're just putting the logic points together, right? When riots happen, disease doesn't spread. But when churches gather, disease spreads. It's a very fascinating logic. And as a result, it's becoming a public nuisance. And if it's a public nuisance, we can bulldoze it. So this is our homeland. We're not used to this sort of logic. This logic flies in the face of our familiarity. What? This is America? This is historic Christianity, guys. This is what it's always been. Where Tertullian will stand before Felix and make an appeal and give a deliberate lie about the church. And depending on the justice level of the judge, Felix actually is swayed. He understands the way or this sect and he understands the battle so he is not going to free Paul but he's not going to punish Paul the way they would want. And so it depends on the justness of the judge in this situation. And so what an interesting parallel. 
So the church in our day and age is suddenly a public menace like a rabid dog. Okay, you follow the logic of where this leads, put it down. So in history, the way the church oftentimes has been persecuted and how persecution will begin is because of this sort of logic. Once the public mind can be convinced that this is dangerous, that this is actually bringing harm, do you see another person caught it? Because they're gathering in there. Once that is sponsored, then the persecution and the removal of liberties for the body of Christ is in full motion. Which is why you see churches backing off. I don't want to meet lest that be assumed about me. And this is an intimidation factor for the body of Christ. In other words, are we going to try and appease this world or do we just know this is how it's always worked? Watch Paul. Does Paul appease? Does Paul say, oh, I recognize they're going to say that there was a disturbance because I came to town. No, he knows that they'll say that. And he moves forward. He just got stoned. <laughs> and he goes back in. What's wrong with this guy? Is he not learning that we as the church don't want to be stoned? We as the church don't want to be beat up. We as the church don't want to be imprisoned. We have a phobia to those things. As opposed to, no, that comes with historic Christianity. We need a reset button. I think last week, I don't know, maybe it was during the week, I, I talked about operating systems. And I said, we have the wrong operating system. Our operating system in this thing known as modern Christianity is self-preservation. When in actuality, the operating system of the kingdom of heaven is self-expenditure, Christ glorification. We need to swap out operating systems for the kingdom pattern of thought where we do not fear what man can do to us. It is suddenly dangerous, and I'm putting quotes around dangerous for those of you that are getting this via podcast in the future. It is suddenly dangerous for the church of Jesus Christ to gather. Disease, and I put that in quotes, will spread. Fear, I'm putting that in quotes, will increase. And disaster, I'm putting that in quotes, will follow close on its heels. So if that is the mindset, you can see why governors are desiring to begin to shut down churches. Now when this all started, one of the things that we discussed as a leadership team is, okay, we don't know what we're dealing with. Are we dealing with the bubonic plague here or are we dealing with something that is like the flu? Don't know. Uh, and so, okay, well, since everything is being closed down, it's not just churches, it doesn't seem to be a, a very specific point of attack on churches, let's graciously walk through this. Let's not create a stir that is unnecessary. However, when there begins to be a distinction and churches are being targeted as the problem and those that are politically correct are exonerated, that shows a hand. And it demonstrates to us, okay, this is a spiritual issue, even if the people doing it are not aware of their contradiction. Okay, I give tremendous grace to these things. They may not be aware of their contradiction, even though some of you in here are like, they know exactly what they're doing. The conspiracy theory is that there is a devil who is out to destroy. He will use people, and there's some cunning people out there, but the coordination always stems from our great rival, our great enemy, Satan. So yes, there's a conspiracy theory, but let's make sure we tag who is behind it. Spiritual powers are behind it. They will use their puppets, yes. But this has always been against the truth, guys. Every day since that creation, it has been against the truth. Are you sure that God's word says this? This is the ancient lie of the devil. He wants to turn Eve against the truth. And so as a result, you're going to see this machination continue. Now look at this. I'm going to stick the same list up on the screen, and I'm going to admit something as the body of Christ. I admit it is, quote unquote, dangerous for the church of Jesus Christ to gather. And then you notice how I, I put disease up there, but I crossed it out. And I said, instead, truth will spread. And guess what? If you're against the truth, I, I could recognize how this could be deemed dangerous. So I will agree, it is dangerous for those that hate the truth. And then I, I crossed out uh, fear, and I put in repentance and faith will increase. I, I get it. 
If you're against that and you think that the great malady of humankind is the gospel of Jesus, yeah, I could see why you would want the church of Jesus Christ not to gather. I get it. And then I have disaster crossed out and I say abundant life will follow close on its heels. And if you celebrate death, we have a culture that celebrates death, by the way, if you haven't figured that one out. I recognize why it would be very dangerous for the church of Jesus Christ to gather and promote and train up and disciple others in this thinking. I get it. However, you have to pick a side. Are you with the dark or are you with the light? Are you with death or are you with life? I am decidedly with Jesus Christ. And therefore, what he requires of us right now, we must do even though there will be ripple effects as a result. We have been prepared for those ripple effects in the word of God. We have been trained, though we have seen the scripture, many of us have not absorbed those realities and never exercised that soul muscle because it has been unnecessary up to this point. Our American ease has not done us any benefits. Whereas we have had open window to share the gospel with the nations, we have not exercised for true Christianity in the midst of that freedom. And as a result, many of us are bargaining with God right now saying, God, if we could just get the right president in November, then we will get serious for you. That's a dangerous line of thought. How about we get serious right now? And it doesn't matter who's president. It's never mattered who was leader of the government. The church has thrived in every situation because we live for Jesus. We have the right, if you want to say it, president on the throne. Capital B, president capital K, King, capital L, Lord. We already have our leadership. We already have our marching orders. We already have the right guy in office. The burning of Rome. It's interesting because I was studying the burning of Rome and I recognized, you know, it's one of those this day in history. You know what day it was? It was yesterday. So today would have been the breakout of persecution. (laughs) Welcome to July 19th. July 18th of 64. Isn't it weird just seeing the date on the screen? Of 64. Nero lights Rome on fire. And then what does he do? He declares it was the Christians that did it. So who's actually creating the problems? Nero. Nero. But what does he do? Well, he has an agenda. It's a political agenda. That's what it was. And it's a, I mean, we actually know what his political agenda was, and I'll read it for you. It's very interesting, and it's not altogether different from the political agenda today. You see, we could say his primary agenda wasn't just Christians. He had other things, fish he was frying. He wanted to change the infrastructure of Rome. He didn't like the way it was all set up. How's he going to deal with it? Well, he needs a crisis. He needs to create something that he can only solve. And the Christians are the biggest irritant in Rome. And he needs to come up with an excuse to do both. This is brilliant. It's cunning. And it's ancient. It is what we have always dealt with as the Christians. Do not consider it strange, my brothers, when Rome burns and you get blamed for it. This is how it has always worked. We take offense at it instead of responding with a smirk and say, watch what my God will do. You see, God is not taken off guard by the enemy's malevolence. He knows exactly what is going on, and he holds the trump card. We serve the guy who is in control. We need to remember that. So the burning of Rome, this is from history.com, as this day in history, that's, that's actually where I got this from. So, legend has long blamed Nero for a couple of reasons. Nero did not like the aesthetics of the city and used the devastation of the fire in order to change much of it and institute new building codes throughout the city. Nero also used the fire to clamp down on the growing influence of Christians in Rome. He arrested, tortured, and executed hundreds of Christians on the pretext that they had something to do with the fire. The pretext that they had something to do with the fire. We gather, and I, I know what's in the back of all of our minds, if something spreads, if there is some 
way that they can link an outbreak of this mysterious COVID-19 to us, to our gathering, they've got us exactly where they want. So are we going to play into their hands? No, so we don't gather. So what this is is some kind of weird game here. Who are we doing this for? We gather not for their sake. We gather for Christ. We gather because he is ushering us into his presence and there's something about the gathering. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be a mega church gathering. But there's something about the gathering of the saints and guess what? It brings life and health. Quite contrary to the fact we don't burn down cities. We make them healthier. Nero, on the other hand, burns down cities. So we need to remember that there's a distinction between the two, and God knows that distinction. Ironically, history knows the distinction too. (laughs) The backlash of missions. So this is what enables me to stick this in my uh, spiritual biography of a nation thing. We are right around the mid-1600s where we have a breakout of martyrdoms, where these missionaries are coming over and we have a backlash against it. The light is shining in a very dark world. Last week I went into the darkness of the American scene. This landscape of North America was pitch black. Beauty, yes, but darkness reigned. Terror reigned. Fear reigned. It was like the streets of New York with gang rule. And whoever was the strongest gang was feared by all. But it was constant menace, constant hazards. There was no law. It was a lawless society. And I've likened it, if, if I could create a link, you know, when you go to Haiti, and since I have two children from Haiti, uh, I understand this dynamic. It's, it's a beautiful place. This island of Hispaniola, the very first place that a settlement is going to be built. That's where Columbus is going to set up his first settlement. This Dominican on one side and Haiti on the other. You go to Haiti and linger there a little. What you're going to find is extreme beauty, but it's not beautiful. It's terrible. There's something terrible there, but it's beautiful. It's the same with this country. It was beautiful. Same mountains, the same trees, same oceans, same lakes. Beauty, but held hostage. God has a purpose for this nation. I've gone through this at varying levels. I said when that conquistador mentality came, uh, came flooding into our nation, what we are going to see is it will turn south. Central and South America are going to get the conquistadors. And they are not going to go north. Why? Because they don't see gold there. They're after gold. But the missionaries are going to go north. Why? Because they're after souls. There's a whole bunch of lost souls in this country, and this country is going to be discovered by missionaries, people that are going out to share the light of Jesus. That doesn't get given to us in our translation. If you listen to our history from the modern rendition of it, you would think the conquistadors discovered all of this and you know, made the maps and uh, just killed the Indians. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't malevolent factors that are going to creep into this. However, there is a pure strain of something extraordinary at the foundations of this country. And when that light is shining, it's like that statement that I made about the fragrance, that we are the fragrance of Christ, and those that are going to reject it are going to face some consequences. You're going to see that. It's weird. You're going to see disease break out amongst the Indians and smallpox, measles, and where are they going to put the blame? Uh On the missionaries. Okay, this is like the history of our country. Isn't that ironic? So the very ones that are coming in to bring life, the very ones that actually did establish a nation and were the groundwork in the laying down of their own lives for literally the most extraordinary nation maybe that has ever existed. I mean, you have Israel back in the Old Testament, but wow, this is something special because we're not Israel under law. We are America under Christ. I mean, that, that's, that's something very special. So I don't want to dismiss it, even though I don't want to worship it. And so what we have is the same tension. We call it the backlash of missions, America in 1650. These white people are carrying disease that will wipe us out if we don't wipe them out first. <laughs> Does that sound like today or, or what? So the body of Christ. I'm going to break up the body of Christ into two different expressions of it. The physical 
the P-H-Y-S, the physical body of Christ, Christ's physical body while here on earth. So he was born and he had a body. In the womb of Mary, he's in a body. A body is fashioned, formed, growing up, maturing. This body is a very real body. So when I say the body of Christ, you can say, which body are you talking about? The physical body of Christ I'm going to refer to in a very specific way in this message. And then we have the spiritual, spear, S-P-I-R, spiritual body, Christ's spiritual body here on earth. It's still here on earth, but guess what? It's the church. It's the ones that in, are indwelt by the spirit of Christ. These hands are his hands. These feet, his feet. This mind is called the mind of Christ. This mouth is his communication vehicle. This heart carries his burdens. So as a result, when this world encounters us, the body of Christ, they actually are supposed to see him. They see him in and through a body, just like we saw the Father in and through Jesus' body. And so as a result, this same mystery of godliness transcends throughout these past 2,000 years. But I'm going to delineate between those two bodies because that's going to be important as we go through this. So the physical body of Christ, remember the one he was in when he was here on earth? It's the place of healing. Now I want you just to pause for a second and ponder that. When that body of Christ gathers, when that body of Christ goes into the world, what happened as a result? Healing followed. He is Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. And he manifests that in this body. When he came to this earth, he literally, wherever he goed, he goed? Did I just say that? Wherever he went, Kids, do not mimic that statement. <laughs> Wherever he went, he brought healing. And that's what's stated over and over again throughout the gospel accounts. That's actually not something to overlook now. To remember is very, very important. Luke 7, 20 through 23, when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? Do you guys remember this story? John's in prison. He sends his disciples to Jesus. Are you the coming one? Or are we looking for another? This is profound because Jesus is going to respond to this in a way that we probably wouldn't expect. And that very hour, he cured many infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits. And to many blind, he gave sight. So what's his answer? They come to him and they say, are you the, the coming one? Silence. And he goes off and heals. Then he responds. <laughs> Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things you have seen and heard. That the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. That those that have COVID-19, it just disappears. Did, was that in the screen? No, was that there? Okay, I added that for those of you that are getting this podcast. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. The body of Christ, what does it do? It brings life. It brings health. Is this something to fear? Well, I guess it depends on which side you're on. Yeah, if I was on the devil's side, I would be terrified of the body of Christ because he has come to crush the head of the serpent. Yep. I don't blame him for being a little disturbed. But if you want to stand for truth and righteousness, if you want to stand on the side of the creator of the heavens and the earth, this doesn't terrify you. This is the delight of delights. We have prayed for this. The coming one has come. Jesus Christ, John 10.10. 10. Now, this, I re referenced this earlier. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. This is the physical body of Christ. What has he come to do? To bring life. The physical body of Christ, the marring of the truth. So his physical body is going to be marred. And if I liken his physical body to the truth in this little illustration, just follow with this. The physical body of Christ is going to be marred or the truth is going to be marred. That's the goal. The enemy wants to mar the truth. Isaiah 52, 14. His visage, his face, was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. This is the devil's working. He wants to mar the physical body. 
And by the way, you can tie that in. He wants to mar the spiritual one as well. The same enemy, same truth, the same ancient lies are at work. And as a result, we recognize, we're not shocked and caught, we're not shocked and caught off guard by the movements of the devil. So now Isaiah 53, which is one of the most memorialized, cherished passages in all of the Bible because it's going to enunciate very clearly the cross of Christ, immediately follows what I just read. And in this, I'm just going to take out this little statement. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But, you see, the body of Christ is going to go through tremendous persecutions. And many of us that don't understand what is taking place will take guesses at why. Just like Job. It's like, well, he must have been disobedient. He must have been spreading COVID-19. He must have been doing something horrible. When in actuality, the reason he is going through this difficulty is so that he can give life. For whatever reason, when we as the church go through difficulty as the spiritual body of Christ, the same thing happens. Life comes out. The world is strengthened when the church properly responds to this ancient liar. When that ancient liar, that ancient marrer that is attempting to distort the realities of who God is, and take this perfect representation of the invisible God and try and decompose it, try and undermine it. When that happens, salvation bursts forth. What we see is a pattern. But by his stripes we are healed. The spiritual body of Christ, you notice I'm putting the same phrase up. It's the place of healing. What? Wait, wait, wait. I, I thought that was the physical body of Christ. When we gather together, we are the body of Christ. Well, whether or not we're gathered together or not, we're the body of Christ. However, we are the spiritual body of Christ. And where we go, when people come to us, what do they find? Healing. They find, I'm not just talking about physical, even though that is apropos in this day and age. I'm talking about they are healed when they come to the body of Christ. And when we go out into this world and people encounter us, what happens to them? Or I should say, what should happen to them? Because many of us, if we were to be honest, would say, I haven't experienced that. The church of Jesus Christ, to me, has not been a place of healing. It's been a place of hurt and harm. Hmm, there's the problem. This starts with us right here. This is God's ancient pattern. It always has been his pattern. We are life givers. We are life bringers. And as a result, when we gather in his name, the world is made healthier, not weaker. So Ephesians 3.10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. God has chosen this as his delivery vehicle. So if this delivery vehicle goes on pause and says, oh, well, we're not going to function as a delivery vehicle until this is all over. You now have no delivery vehicle of the manifold wisdom of God unto the heavenly realms. It is critical that we function in agreement with our calling. We are the chosen vehicle of God. We are known as the church of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph, in Christ. And through us, diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. That word for diffuse, especially with our diffusers that we have, you know, you stick that little diffuser on your counter, it's like, pfft. it actually, which is not a bad word for this, but it means to make manifest or to reveal, to make known. And so as a result, it's weird because we make known and make visible, in a sense, a fragrance? That's odd. So it diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death. And to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? Song of Solomon 1.3 there seems to be this idea of a fragrance that is associated with Christ. And you're going to see that come out in the Song of Solomon over and over and over again. 
And you're going to see it in the Holy of Holies. There is a very specific fragrance that will be defined. It's interesting. It's not just the plating of gold. It's not just the cherubim and how their wings are structured. It's not just the visuals. It's the, uh, the what you get as a fragrance. I mean, that is a, an odd thought. And yet it is going to be very defined. There's a very specific incense, frankincense and myrrh. Isn't that a fascinating statement? Think about what Jesus is going to receive as his gifts. The Holy of Holies is plated with gold and it smells of frankincense and myrrh. What is this? This is the throne room of grace. This is where the king of all kings sits enthroned. And there is a fragrance for those of us that are in Christ that we bear the fragrance of that holy place. And that holy place is a threat to some because they have chosen to love their darkness I, don't, I, I totally get it. If you're trying to sleep at night and someone turns on a light, what does it do? It get, sort of gets you upset. Hey, hey, turn off that light. Yeah, that's sort of what a world is like when it's trying to sleep. Our world is trying to sleep and we come into the room and we're gonna turn on a light. Why? Because we love them. Because we know that if they stay in that comatose state, they're going to be eternally separated from God Almighty. They have one shot at hearing this truth and for whatever reason, God has set me or you in their life. And at first, it's going to be translated as a threat. However, if you cower in that moment and don't flick on the light switch, that person could be lost for eternity. Yes, they could reject your message and they could kill you because of it. But that's a risk you're ready to take. Because God has put value on that soul. He said, I shed my blood for that soul. Take the risk. Oh, I didn't even read the scripture. Because of the fragrance of your good ointments, your name is ointment poured forth. Therefore, the virgins love you. Song of Solomon 3, 6 through 10. This is an incredible picture. The Shulamite is the bride. This is, and she's the one speaking this. This is an incredible picture of the church as far as I'm concerned. This is Christ's uh, carriage coming into the world. It's mobile and it goes and it takes his legendary person with him. The Shulamite says, who is this coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke perfumed with myrrh and frankincense with all the merchant's fragrant powders? Behold, it is Solomon's carriage with 60 valiant men around of the valiant of Israel. They all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man has his sword on his thigh because of fear in the night. Of the wood of Lebanon, Solomon the king made himself a chariot. He made its pillars of silver, its support of gold, its seat of purple, its interior paved with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. There's something about that I really like. That's where we dwell. We dwell in this chariot, this chariot of Christ that is surrounded by the most valiant men with their swords drawn. We are in Christ. We are not afraid of the terrors by night, nor the arrow that flies by day. We are covered in the shadow of the Almighty, and though a thousand would fall at our side and 10,000 at our right hand, we will not fear. This is the state of the church of Jesus Christ throughout history. There is a boldness, a resolve within the church that we are missing today. I feel God stirring inside of me in a way that is hard to describe. I haven't yet put words to it, but it's probably going to be coming soon. And that is, I recognize that I have gone through a cowardice state in all of this, where I've had to work it through, where I recognize my cowardice, and I'm like, God, I don't like that. I don't like the fact that I'm sensing that I'm supposed to do something, but I don't want to. I don't like that. I want to want to do what you want me to do. And so I've, the Spirit of God has tagged a certain cowardice in me, and he is convincing me of the beauty and the glories of walking with him through this upcoming season. Of persecution. Get this, okay? If you can believe this, God is preparing the insides of Eric Ludi 
to smile at what's happening, to actually delight in the friction, and to cherish the fact that I get to be one of the light carriers right now. That it's like the privilege of privileges. Do you remember the Shackleton adventure? I mean, the guy is on the most crazy adventure to Antarctica, and safe return is doubtful. And yet, the adventure was a call to, to men, and men wanted the adventure. Well, that's natural man. The call of Christ appeals to the spiritual man, where we literally are willing to leave our comforts of Great Britain, and we are willing to go into the unknowns the terrors. I mean, well, you could hit an iceberg. You could go down into the frigid waters. You could play it out in your mind a thousand times over all the things that could happen. And yet, I, I get to go on an adventure with Christ. <laughs> you, you like want me to go? You, you're actually handpicking me? Yes, Lord. It would be my privilege. But there's actually a smirk and a smile inside of my soul, a readiness that is taking place. I sense the movements of darkness. I sense it. I don't know if it's just me or if it's all of us. I don't know because I'm only in me. <laughs> I'm only in this body. I don't live and walk in your body too simultaneously. Oh, that's weird. I had that same feeling. And so I don't know where the resonance level is yet in the body. I haven't gotten to the point where I, I'm going to articulate this rising up in preparation for war. When you study Great Britain in 1939, you're going to see the most pathetic nation maybe you've ever witnessed. You're going to want to hold them in contempt and mock them. And yet that generation is going to be considered the greatest generation ever in the upcoming years. That's weird. What happened? 1940 happened. And they were awakened from their slumber. And they rose up to stand against the evil the same guys that are going to rise up were actually the greatest problems in the culture at the time. It was the young people. And they were the ones that were mocking any leadership that would dare think that anything other than appeasement was good. Peace, peace at all costs. But this is Hitler. Peace, peace. The same ones are going to have their minds shift. And 1940 is going to be one of the most impressive years in Great Britain's history. Same people. Okay, when I look at the church today, I'm appalled of the silence. People, what are we doing? There's a great enemy, and he's converging upon the body of Christ. What are we doing? Ah! You get this feeling that political correctness is ruling the day. Peace, peace at all costs. That same troop can be aroused to be considered the greatest generations of Christians the world has ever seen. I don't know what you're praying for, but I think we should ask for that. The spiritual body of Christ. What do we know about the spiritual body of Christ? We are life carriers. We bear light, truth, health, love, joy, and peace. When we gather, people are made stronger. When we go into this world, we bring healing, wholeness, and restoration to that which is broken. I do not care what is correct today in this world. I care what the body of Christ has been commissioned to and what the Word of God reveals we should be doing. And if it is different than what the world is telling us we should be doing, we will do what the Word of God commands us to do. I do not care what happens as a result. I expect friction. We are called to deliver love to this generation, and we cannot do that on the enemy's terms. Oh, here's how you can deliver love. Don't gather. Don't sing. That, that was the California edict. Don't sing. <laughs> You see, we are being conformed into the image of the world and we don't even recognize it. I say, let's wake up. Oh, 1939 Great Britain, awake from your slumber. I thought of a, a quote this morning that I think you guys would like. 
You are Elastigirl, pull yourself together. Okay, I, sh I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't use any pop culture to make a, a point at all, but that's from The Incredibles. Uh, and, I mean, here you have this great superhero that's sort of gone into semi-retirement, doesn't function in her strength anymore, and this, you know, it's a great line. <laughs> we need the same line. Excuse me, don't you realize who you are, oh, sons and daughters of the Most High God? The ones hand selected by the Spirit of God for such an hour as this and indwelt by His Almighty Presence. Wake up, O oh superheroes of our modern day. You are the chosen delivery vehicle and don't buy the lie that you are bringing death and destruction. You are bringing life and health. So be bold and give this world what they need even when they don't realize they need it. So wake up, you are the church of Jesus Christ. Act like it. Father, here we are. We recognize that we need you to be able to move forward. We need you to function as we ought to function. We are cowards. We esteem correctness more than truth. And Lord Jesus, we want to repent as the body of Christ for placating, for pacifying, for appeasing a culture around us instead of boldly standing for the truth of our King in this hour. Lord, correct us to your pattern. Purge us of all worldliness. Purge us of timidity and fill us with your spirit of boldness for such an hour as this. Rouse us as your church, as your soldiers. Lord, may we transfer from 1939 to 1940. May this be the greatest generation of Christians Ever. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we ask this. Amen.